The experts at the British Film Institute who are restoring some of the earliest Charlie Chaplin films already know and love Chaplin, but what about today's movie-going audiences? Once again, here's Sue Ellicott. Up until now, these films have just been looked on as museum pieces, you know, for interest only to the cognoscenti who are interested in Chaplin. Well, no way. Now we see that these are valid films for a modern audience. Great comedy. Doesn't matter they were made in 1914. If you get an audience sitting in front of that screen with the right music and projected at the right speed, they're going to work just as well as they did then. Only a handful of pianists in Britain specialise in accompanying silent movies. Composer Neil Brand is one of them. Give the strong man his music. Though he wasn't a big fan of Chaplin's early comedies until the British Film Institute began to restore them. These movies, when I first saw them, were kind of cut to bits. You were basically watching a lot of people running around very fast and falling over and hitting each other. And there wasn't any kind of real structure to it or any sense of subtlety. Now you can see very small changes in facial expression, which actually Charlie does himself. He'll do tiny little looks at the camera, for instance. There'll only be a glance. But that is something you would never have been able to see in an earlier version. It had to be restored, really, to be able to see that. The restored version of Chaplin's 10th movie, Mabel at the Wheel, is getting its first public screening here in London's Trafalgar Square. For the film experts who've worked so hard to recreate Chaplin's vision, it's a milestone. This is the silver screen at its simplest. No special effects, no popcorn. Instead, a chance to see if Chaplin's comedy stands the test of time. By actually restoring that quality to the image, we give the next generation a whole new chance to actually discover Chaplin, to discover why he became this international phenomenon. So if we don't do this, we don't give people an opportunity to really understand Chaplin. The significance of these films is that we get to see what we think they might be, the way that people saw them at the time, but also it shows us how their performance works. We have Chaplin from the English Music Hall, Fatty Arbuckle from American Vaudeville. Um, there are a number of different kinds of traditions that are coming together. There's a sort of drama to film restoration, that it must be a great film, it must be Lawrence of Arabia you restore, that it's a great work of art, like a masterpiece, that we're actually going back and restoring that with this incredible sort of gravitas is a little ironic, that it's just, yeah, it's a bunch of guys at the Keystone Studio goofing off. You can check when shots differ. Kieran Webb is one of the technicians breathing life into the old comedies, revealing their artistry and Chaplin's skills as a performer. It doesn't take long before all four versions of this Keystone comedy, a film Johnny, Chaplin's fifth film, are out of sync. Initially, we'll just be examining it to establish the continuity, as far as we can, of the original film. And we'll also be looking at how long each individual shot is so we can build up an ideal shot list and that way that will provide the cutting notes for our finished version. Then as today, movie theatre owners were keen to sell as many tickets as possible. I think by and large the cuts that were made to these would seem to be commercial. They just wanted shorter versions, shorter running times maybe. So do you think they're funnier when they're restored? Uh, yes, I do. They knew what they were doing. The people who worked for Keystone were very skilled comedians and knew exactly what they were doing and didn't really waste a lot of film. It's uh, ironic that people felt they could re-edit their films to make them better. There's clues that we look for when we're actually trying to restore these kinds of films, especially when you have multiple sources. There's codes on the edge of the film that will tell you the date that something was printed. That's a clue. There are certain splice marks that we know came from the original studio. It's intense work, 
but work that often brings moments of great reward. There was a thing that was bugging me for days because I seemed to be missing a shot and yet all the copies were telling me the same thing. When I finally found that we had another copy with the missing shot, I realised that all the reissues, since they were missing that shot, had simply cut one of the previous shots in half and moved it along a bit. It's a sort of eureka moment when you have putting the jigsaw back together again. A small detail that can determine whether we laugh or not. It's the fact that it's appealing so much to my enjoyment as an audience that makes it easy to play as a piano player. What I'm doing is taking my response and turning it into music. This moment, particularly with Charlie doing the ripping, I don't think we've ever been able to see him ripping the handkerchief properly before. And each time he does it, the strong man thinks his tights have split. For modern audiences, Chaplin's comedies seem quite tame, chaste even. Not in their day, though. The Keystones were hugely popular, but some critics found fault. Listen to this August 1914 review in the magazine Moving Picture World of The Property Man. There are very few people who don't like the Keystones, but they are thoroughly vulgar, and they are not the best pictures for a parlor entertainment. There is also some brutality in this picture, and we can't help feeling that this is reprehensible. Chaplin created almost a sense of film that we've never lived up to again, I don't think, of, of it simultaneously being worthy of intellectual scrutiny and aesthetic discussion and belly laughs from, you know, the common public. He was almost immediately popular. And Keystone was a popular studio. It was a good studio for Chaplin to start out with. The meteoric rise, it's hard to underestimate it. He went from $150 a week in 1914 to 10000 a week in 1916. He's so important, and yet he's taken for granted. And for, I think, many people, even including some scholars, he's almost more an image than somebody whose films they know very, very well. Now, over 90 years after they first came out, it's easy once again to get to know Chaplin's earliest films, and we can judge for ourselves. Sue Ellicott reporting from London. When we come back, we'll turn to some of tonight's election results.